Raj, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you've built an incredible company, which I want to talk about in Bloom Reach, and you have an you actually have an incredible background in venture, and you're an investor, and and all these various things. But I thought we would start with your book, The Digital Seeker, which I highly recommend everybody buy, go read, um, check it out, uh, because it's all about how digital teams win big. And it's interesting that um, it, to me, like, I guess in like 2023, it's like teams, not just, you know, because all, all teams That's are right. kind of digital at this point, right? What inspired you to write the book? Yeah, well, first, Clint, it's great to be here with you. Um, excited to have this conversation with you and, and um, fun to start with a book. Uh, yeah, so The Digital Seeker really came out for me of a distillation of a thought process that I've had over many years building Bloomreach. And so at Bloomreach, over the course of 10, you know, now almost 15 years, we had really been working with some of the winners, some of the losers in digital and observed what they were doing to create these great digital businesses. And so I really felt like it was important that the teams involved in, in digital, that the leadership teams, that the investors community that was investing in digital understand how to parse out the winners from the losers and what attributes represented one side from the other. And so the book was um, kind of a research undertaking. I, I decided that I wasn't going to just write what I thought. I was going to go interview. And I ultimately did probably 100 interviews with different C-level executives at all kinds of industries you know, um, in retail, for sure, in uh, travel and hospitality, but also in government, in healthcare, in uh, nonprofit organizations, to really distill what the, the key learnings were. Um, and out of that came the digital seeker. So what I hope is that it's certainly a book about leadership and how the teams win, but it's a deep understanding of how you get there, um, you know, and what the common attributes are. Right. And what did you learn, like interviewing that many executives yeah. and C-suite leaders? So, you know, what was so interesting was um, the themes actually really came out really clearly. And so the first thing was that you build not for your customer, but for and, and what they tell you they're interested in, but what they're really seeking. And, and that's why mm -hmm. it's called the digital seeker. And, and what do I mean by that to make that really real? Like, you know, you, you go out and you go say, hey, I'm going to go on Home Depot and I'm going to go look for plywood. And so you're a customer of plywood. But what you're seeking is a collection of materials and maybe ultimately a playbook to go build a deck. You might go and you might say, hey, I'm interested in a travel bag. But what you're seeking is a great vacation with your kids. And so what's interesting is if you start to build the digital experience just simply to fulfill the demand that the customer is coming to you with, then how different are you than the next person that can go build that experience and sell that same bag and sell, sell that same plywood? But on the other hand, if you can encompass, hey, this is where you come to go build the deck, and yes, we sell you some plywood, or this is where you come to go organize your vacation, and yes, you know, we will sell you uh, a travel bag along the way. Now, all of a sudden, the quality and the level of differentiation of that experience is so deep uh, and so compelling and has so much more of a moat that you win big and digital. What role does Bloomreach play in all of this? Yeah, so Bloomreach, we think of you know, as a commerce experience cloud. What that means is we're in the business of working with people who sell stuff online. Uh, that could be you know, big brands like Neiman Marcus and, and uh and REI and folks like that, but it could be, you know, kind of an emer emerging brand that, uh, you know, is uh, selling sandals online or selling uh, travel services online or selling restaurants, uh, restaurant reservations. And we'll go personalize that experience and make sure that every aspect of the customer experience speaks to the consumer is highly personalized and ultimately performs and drives more revenue for brands. And so we work with almost a quarter of e-commerce in the US and the UK. So if you're shopping online, there's a good chance the web page you're seeing, the email you're receiving, the SMS you're getting is behind the scenes powered by Bloomreach. And it's computing exactly what to present to you so that you have a delightful experience as a consumer. And so the brand makes a lot of money. So we're, we're, in, we're squarely in this digital world. We see a lot of the best, we see a lot of the worst, and, uh, and we're excited to power so much of it. Yeah, what makes a great customer experience in, in your experience, having done this for so long and being in the middle of, again, like you said, like some of the best brands in the world, 
maybe seeing some of the the ones who don't do it as well. What makes a great customer experience? I think a great customer experience is one, first of all, some of the best you almost don't notice, right? Like you just, you're out there, you're on, you know, when we, when we all experienced the first iPhone, it just was easier in many ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, When, when we go out and we, we, many of us are subscribers to Amazon prime, which I think is a great customer experience because it just speaks to, Hey, I want to buy a lot of products really easily. And and I want shipping to be cheap. Uh, So customer experience can stand for different things. It's not always like um, the, you know, something that you notice. Sometimes it's just, it just happens. But sometimes it, it also speaks to this underlying consumer sentiment or customer sentiment where you're sort of like, you know, um, that's cool. I was thinking about, uh, you know, buying, buying flowers and all of a sudden the journey took me to chocolates and I hadn't thought about chocolates, but yeah, chocolates is a better idea than flowers. So there's some sparks that it, you know, um, get, it, it promotes at times. And so you kind of know it when you see it, but it always starts with this notion of the seeker. What is my customer seeking and am I delivering that? And then there's a, there, there's a lot that teams have to do to actually fulfill that level of expectation of, of the seeker. And a lot of what you're talking about makes up a brand. That's kind of like what a brand is, right? And, um, you know, it's not just a logo or color scheme or, or that type of thing. There's like a story behind it, um, sure, which I think that that's probably super important. But also, but it seems like the brand is the experience you have with it at the end of the day. What do you think of that? Is that true? And what makes a great brand? Well, the most important thing about a brand, in my mind, is that is that instantaneously it has an association with something. So, you know, the, the most dilute brands are ones where you ask, Hey, what does that brand stand for? And you think, I'm not sure. I mean, Mm -hmm. it stands for this and that, and this and that. And so when it's a and B and C and D, then it's none of the above really. So, you know, let's take a a good example. One that, one that I love in the e-commerce world, which is Patagonia, right? You can say Patagonia to anybody and people will be like, it stands for saving the earth. It stands mm-hmm. for the, you know, the environment because that's what Patagonia is. Uh, and everything is wrapped around it. The fabric, the giving, the culture, the marketing, the product, everything is, is wrapped around that brand uh, and that brand. And it's pretty hard to, to do, to be clear. Like that's a pretty high bar uh, to achieve, but that's when you know it means something. It's, it's less, you know, people agonize over the what, like, what do we stand for? What does the brand about? But more important is that you stand for something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you make that authentic though? Like, and how, like, it's, well, it, it, yeah, that, I think that's an interesting point. Like Patagonia, that's obviously authentic to their core. That's that they believe that they're trying to accomplish that. Like you said, it's like become like the ethos of the brand, but then you have people who try to do that and it doesn't come across as authentic. Exactly. And, and that's why it requires deep inspection of really authentic, you know, every company <clears throat> doesn't get to a certain size or scale without being about something. Often where leaders screw up is they want it to be about one thing, but it really isn't. And then they put the want ahead and they say, oh, well, our brand is going to be aspirational. It's going to be the want, but there's not enough of an authentic base, you know, um, around it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, I think, a lot of what we think about at Bloomreach is, you know, the limitless potential of AI. That's a big part of what we do and how we deliver the quality of experiences. And so we stand for that limitless potential. And so the question is, you know, as we're speaking to our customers, as we're building products, as we're thinking about our marketing, does that come through? And it's a work in progress because there's a lot of things that will pull you in a lot of other directions as you're building that brand out. But I, I think, I think it is, it has to be authentic because customers and consumers will see through you instantaneously if it's not right when you think of ai and you're right in the thick of it and it's become a big part of your platform and you just said like hey it's limitless the opportunities that can yeah. happen there what it like what about it scares you what about it excites you what about it do you think people are missing particularly on the consumer and e-commerce side of things yeah so first of all you know when i started bloom reach which which at this point was in 2009 the thesis was Hey, you weren't human beings weren't going to go manually creating websites and apps and emails, writing email messages. AI and machine learning was going to play a critical role in doing that. That's that was the sort of almost the founding statement 
of the company. So, you know, when here we are 14, 15 years later, and you know, actually a lot of AI has has been incorporated into our products and others, but it's finally arrived, I would say, in a in a very serious way. Um, and what's interesting is that it still feels very much like the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what's crazy, is that if I were to give you an analogy, it feels like internet 1997, or it feels like, uh, you know, mobile applications in 2009 or 2010. Like we got a long way to go uh, in terms of what kind of impact AI is gonna have. But, but if we break it down, I think the, the, the thing that AI uh, has always done better than most human beings is process large amounts of data, make sense of it, and then do something with it, right? So in a self-driving car, it processes data related to sensors and it helps navigate. In a e-commerce website, it processes consumer sentiment and products and it delivers high quality search, for example, is what one thing we do, or more targeted marketing campaigns is another thing we do with AI. So it's really good at taking large amounts of data and making sense of it. But what's happened in the last year has been yet another step function. We've always said, all right, AI is pretty good at making sense of stuff and doing things that manually we couldn't possibly process, but it can't possibly be created. It can't create anything. And what's mm -hmm. happened in the last year is with this new field of what's called generative AI, we're now in a world where AI can create stuff where, and we've seen it, we've seen it with chat GPT, where it, you write to it and it writes language back. We've seen it with Dali where it can create images and paintings. We've seen it with character.ai where it can create virtual characters that can be your friend. So it's kind of crazy to think about the yeah, fact it is that, crazy. That, that we can now open up a world where AI is at the heart of not just execution of manual tasks, and it can certainly do that very well, but also creativity. Yeah, isn't that fascinating? I, I keep going back to like authenticity though. Like if you're a brand and a lot of what you're generating um, creatively or speaking to your customers is coming from an AI, how do you make sure that's like authentic, you know? So, you know, I, I, uh, I often say that, um, you know, the AI is what you put into it, right. right? So yes, it's incredibly powerful, but you know, the AI doesn't go represent your brand. You train the AI to represent your brand. That becomes your new responsibility. What you used to do is you used to go say, hey, when um, you used to manually go in and say, hey, when somebody goes and buys these flip-flops, I want to recommend to them, you know, this additional towel. Uh, and you used to do that manually as a human being. And, that, and, then, and you're getting the voice. Then, then machine learning came along and said, you know, every time people buy flip-flops, they tend to buy towels. Let's just recommend some towels. And that's where we've been. And now the AI might make sense of the whole thing and say, you know, hey, um, we can go create a custom towel for you. We can go create a whole bag of, of swimwear. We can go, uh, we can go create imagery that speaks to you because you live in, you know, a beach town and you're going to feel like, you know, you're shopping at a retailer that is your local store. We're going to know more about the flip-flops than anybody else so that you're going to feel like you're talking to the best sales associate ever. So there's a lot of power that you can harness, uh, but ultimately when the AI represents you on your website, on your app, in your phone, it's exactly that. It's a representation of your brand. So you have your responsibility to train it to do that because otherwise it might do a really poor job of representing your brand. Right. Yeah. That, I think that's the thing that um, what you just touched on their companies need to um, really hone in on and understand like, you're training the AI. The AI isn't just coming up with stuff, right? Like it's, exactly. it's representing uh, your brand and representing what you put into it. I think that that's an, that's you a, know, a good point. Uh, another good analogy of that is you used to be the player. Now you're the coach. Right. Right. So you, it's still your product on the field, but you don't get to be the player anymore. The AI is the player, but you still got to coach the AI. How do you talk to consumer brands and, and other e-commerce companies about the right platforms to reach customers? Because there's so many different platforms. I mean, you got Instagram, TikTok, all the social media ones, some that I probably don't even know that you do know where you're reaching your customers. I mean, how do you maintain you know, your brand and your experience across all of these platforms? 
You know, I mean, what we if we've learned one thing about consumer platforms over the last 10 or 15 years, it's that they're incredibly dynamic. There was there was a time when, you know, a generation of people grew up on Facebook and now nobody uses Facebook below a certain age, right? And then mm-hmm. Instagram and now TikTok and um, you know, and uh my daughter uses Be Real, uh, which is a, you know, kind of another platform. So Oh yeah, yeah. And then there you got you you, you got a generation particularly of boys, but not just boys who, who, whose, whose social platform is their gaming platform. Uh, so I, I think, I think what we have learned from that is that if you, you never bet on one, you follow where the consumer goes and you allocate your resources, your time and your attention there. And you just assume it's going to change next year because that's, that's what happens. It changes about as often as, you know, fashion does. Yeah. Yeah, and the big player in the space obviously is Amazon. How do you talk to your customers and brands and e-commerce players about how to interact with Amazon? How to, you know, I mean, it's, Amazon's such an interesting ecosystem all by itself. Um, what what do you talk when you talk about Amazon with your customers? What type of, type of questions are they asking you, and what advice are you giving them? You know, what's interesting is sort of like five years ago when I was working with all these big retailers, they had like deep fear of Amazon. Mm-hmm. So sort of like Amazon's going to come eat my lunch. You know, they, they've already taken over. They went from books to electronics, to home, to, to apparel, to so on and so forth. And they're just going category by category and they're eating my lunch. And what's interesting is Amazon, you know, um, wh- uh, while it continues to do very well, it's also become pretty clear. I mean, and just by way of example, if you take the last couple of years, believe it or not, walmart.com has grown faster than Amazon. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's one thing. And then on the other thing, people have said, you know what, Amazon might be able to sell everything, but they can't deliver a quality of experience for my, if I'm selling eyeglasses, it's still a better experience to go to Warby Parker than to go to Amazon. If I'm, uh, you know, if I'm selling, if I want electronics, you know, uh, purchased and also installed in, in, in my home for a, for a home theater system, I probably will get a better experience from you know Best Buy and and, uh, and uh, their services arms than Amazon. So it's they don't seem quite as daunting. They're still dominant. There's no doubt about it. But a lot of folks have figured out if you do a great job of your category in a specialty oriented way and deliver a high quality experience that speaks to the seeker, mm-hmm. you can you you can beat Amazon. Yeah, isn't that remarkable? Like that's kind of the beauty of e-commerce and the consumer brand space period is like if you just have a great product, great brand, great yeah. customer experience, you can really go a long ways. Has uh, Shopify kind of democratized it a little bit like uh, yeah. like anybody can kind of do this? Yeah, I mean, Shopify has been one of the great counterweights to Amazon, right? Because mm-hmm. Shopify came in and said, hey, you can go create a store and then you can drive demand to it. And you don't have to just make a living listing your products on Amazon. Uh, and I think it created millions of entrepreneurs. Uh, now it's going through a tough time because after COVID and after and a, as the uh, sort of recessionary wave hits the macroeconomic picture, some of those smaller businesses are struggling. But all in, it's been terrific that millions of brands have been able to get online. A subset of them are are achieving a reasonable amount of scale. Generally, what what a lot of the brands that reach kind of ten, fifteen million dollars of online sales, they then call Bloomreach and they say, hey, we now have a e-commerce site that's performing. We want to grow to 50. Can you help us? And, and we've got a range of ways by which we can do that. So we work with a lot of them. And uh, and I think they definitely democratized e-commerce. They provided a terrific counterweight uh, and they made it possible for you to build an independent brand uh, at scale and not be dependent purely on Amazon and, and Google. Yeah, at Bloomreach, you call yourself a cons- commerce experience cloud. Tell us what that means. Yeah, it basically means, hey, uh, you know, if we think about e-commerce for a second here, we're about 25 years in, right? We started, we were, we're in 2023. It's kind of late 90s when this whole thing started. And if we think about what we've done as an industry, I would say what we've done is we make it, make, made it possible to buy stuff online. And that's great. But making it possible to buy stuff online doesn't mean people actually will have a great experience when they buy that thing online or will want to keep coming back and back 
or will want to buy more of it, or will we'll, we'll have a different and better experience than they might have at a store. So I think we're early innings in e-commerce. I mean, believe it or not, we're only 20% of retail sales happen online. 80% still happen offline. So we got a long way to go. And so the idea of a commerce experience cloud is to say, it's not just about selling stuff online. That's what commerce is. It's about creating the quality of customer experience that's amazing so that that consumer has an amazing experience with your brand, buys more stuff, achieves their own motivations for why they bought that stuff and keep coming back and back and back and creating the kind of loyalty that makes it possible. So the commerce experience cloud is about doing exactly that and does that kind of in two primary ways. It helps engage more customers to the brand. It, it makes them aware that you sell that handbag, that you sell that car. And it does that with email and SMS and web and other marketing. And then once you're interested in buying the car or the part or the vacuum cleaner or the, the dress, then it will power the e-commerce experience, the website with a highly personalized uh, interaction so that you and I have very different experiences that speak to us and, and, and enable us to then buy that product really easily. So that's what we call the commerce experience. It's sort of everything before I hit add to cart on, right. on an e-commerce brand. And what about everything after the sale goes through, right? Isn't there, that, there's like that whole follow-up piece of it of like surveys and trying to get returning customers yeah. and things like that? Well, I think, I think generally what we, what we say to people is, look, we're going to get people to add to cart. And then once they buy, we're going to get, get back to them, right? So that's when the surveys and, hey, maybe you want to buy something else or how was the service? Uh, all those things are after. There is a transactional piece in the middle, which is sort of like, I got to make sure the packages ship. I got to make sure there's not fraud. I got to collect payments, which is what platforms like Shopify and Salesforce at the higher end do a great job of doing. And, and we at Bloomreach don't, don't cover that space because they do a really good job of making, making sure that, um, that, that they handle that. But we're all about the customer experience to get them to buy and then to get, to get them to keep coming back and buy more and more. What have you learned about leadership? Uh, in your time leading this company and maintaining a culture and building a team? Well, yeah, no, this is a, this is a rich topic. And, and just to tell you the Bloomreach story in a nutshell, you know, I started Bloomreach in 2009 with, with a co-founder and we got started with four or five people. And today we're a thousand people globally. And over this period of time, it hasn't been up and to the right perpetually, right? Like if I were to summarize our journey, it's been, it was a rocket ship early, you know, and then we hit a couple of icebergs and it was, you know, a, a real struggle in the middle. And then it's been a rocket ship again in the last kind of six or seven years. And so, you know, to me, that's what leadership is. Leadership isn't about leading through the good times. It's about creating the good times by leading through the bad times. Uh, and, and that's where, where I think what I have learned is, you know, know why you're doing your, what you're doing. Be authentic to yourself and how you lead. And then communicate in a way that represents that authenticity to your team um, and be in it, right? I mean, probably the most important thing I did in, in those iceberg years was just say to people, look, we're hitting a bunch of icebergs. It's not going well. I wouldn't fault anybody for walking out the door today. But what I can tell you is the destination is still worthy. We still have a lot of the assets to get there. And I'm here. And that certainty helped us get through a lot of those iceberg years. Do you feel like the, the iceberg years are kind of what forge the bonds and relationships and within the team and like this, like, man, look at we, what we just did. Look what we just got through and came out the other side of. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the only thing better than reaching the mountaintop is almost reaching the mountaintop, falling and then reaching a higher mountaintop. Yeah. And so absolutely. Um, it is hugely, hugely a bonding and also um, creates a lot of trust and motivation, right? Um, and appreciation, gratitude as well. So there's a lot of attributes of failure that are deeply underappreciated. Uh, we celebrate success a lot, but we don't really think about how failure creates success and uh, why it does. Uh, and, and yeah, I think it's, it's, it's those years were really important, you know, ultimately to create a scalable, sustainable world-class business. 
When you went from just like, you know, a few people to now over a thousand, how have you maintained the culture? How have you maintained Bloomreach's brand, Bloomreach's experience from an, uh, an yeah. employee standpoint? You know, I, I'm a I'm a deep believer in culture, but I think a lot of people think culture is a lot of people understand how to talk about culture, but don't know how to create and reinforce culture. And uh, to us, we, what we've done at Bloomer is first of all, you know, the values and culture was a document I wrote before I even started the company. I, I had started previous companies. I had seen a degradation in culture. So we wrote those principles in before we started the business and they remain the same principles and the same values today, 15 years later. And they are so inculcated in every employee that I could walk out the door, you know, tomorrow and people would talk about the culture and what it represents. It's, it's not my, it's not my doing anymore. It's taken on a life of its own. And so it's been at the heart of everything. We've reinforced it at every turn. Um, we re and we, we set a pretty clear mission for the company, which is that this is going to be the single most impactful professional experience of your life. And we, we try to live up to that goal. We don't always get there. Uh, and we recognize that culture is always a work in progress. So that's a very important part of what we do is we have built a collection of operational processes where every quarter, the same way we manage to revenue targets and product releases and uh, customers, we manage to our culture and our barometer. We survey, we collect a lot of data and it's always getting better. And we're always fixing what's broken. So we never say, hey, we wrote the principles on the wall 15 years ago, let's just talk about it. We're always tweaking and tuning and improving and fixing. And over the course of the time, if you do you know, 14 years of doing this multiplied by four quarters, the culture gets pretty good and gets pretty real and gets pretty meaningful. And so it's no surprise now, you know, when we survey people, uh, you know, it's got an employee NPS of almost 50, uh, you know, in terms of promotion of the company. And through the COVID years, when, when lots of people were resigning, as we were all going remote, Bloomreach never experienced any of that because that's how strong that cultural foundation has been. Yeah, I can tell you're still super passionate about it, uh, both both the company, the industry you're in, all that type of stuff, and having done it for 14 years. What's the future of Bloomreach? I mean, how long? I mean, how how far do you want to take this thing? Okay, I think we're str scratching the surface. You know, I mean, it. Yes, it's been. You know, it's been. It's Bloomreach is exactly where my 14 year old son is, like in his life. Yeah. <laughs> right. He was actually he was actually born the same month that I started the company. And he's a 14 year old teenager. We all know what 14 year old teenagers are like, right? They, yeah, they, they're a lot further along than four year old kids, but they got a long way to go. And that's how I feel about Bloomberg's pretty much. Uh, CEO, by the way, thank you so much for joining us again. I, I, I highly recommend people uh, read your book, The Digital Seeker. I think your insights there are invaluable for people who are in the consumer and e-commerce space. Um, we end every interview the same way at co.com at co.com. We believe, uh, life is just about, uh, just as much about the chances you give as the chances you take on yourself. I wonder if there's someone who stands out to you who has given you a chance that's kind of led to where you are today. Well, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, you know, kind of my first entrepreneurial endeavor, which was, uh, when I was 21 years old and, uh, I was thinking about going back to school. And uh, I, there was a guy who, who was my boss's boss's boss. Uh, and I was working at a bank in New York. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about going and starting this company. Do you want to you come work with me to go make that happen? And I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know anything about entrepreneurship. I don't know anything about, about anything, frankly. Um, so I'm probably going to go back to school. But sure, I'll spend the summer with you and, um, and, and work with you. And at the end of the summer, I loved it so much. And he trusted me so much you know, at the, at the time, a kid who was 20, 25 years younger than him. And he said, look, I trust you enough. Like, we're going to go start this business in Europe. And I live in New York. So, and I can't move. Why don't you go do it? And, and I'll back you and I'll make it happen. And I had no experience. I had no, there was no reason for him to trust me to do that. Um, but he did. And I moved to Europe at 21, having never been there before, and started my first business with him. And he backed me through that journey. And I just learned so much. And, and most more important than anything else, it gave me the confidence to keep doing it over and over. That's incredible. Raj, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really, I'm so impressed with everything you've built. Congratulations on everything. And uh, let's keep in touch. Sounds great, Clint.